be used in all kinds of situations where the other person might feel threatened. Let me try a simple example. A debt collection letter. Probably one of the most threatening letters you can send somebody. When I get a letter that says I owe money, I tend to be defensive and not very clear-headed about it. Consider this middle paragraph from a debt collection letter. We appreciate your business, but please give us a break. Your account is overdue 10 months. That means we've carried you longer than your mother did. Um, notice how different that is from, if we do not receive payment in 14 days, we will turn this over to our attorney. That makes people get defensive. And even if they pay up, they're gonna pay up with a scowl on their face. If you can get people to laugh and realize that they owe you money and pay up, much more successful. Since 1978, I've been doing research on humor and its importance in all areas of life, especially in the workplace. I've written four books and over 50 articles about humor and various applications, especially, as I said, in the workplace. In 2004, I was elected president of the International Society for Humor Studies. Uh, that summer, we met in Dijon, France, and my family's still eating the jars and jars of mustard that I brought home. Uh, in 1988, I took the show on the road by launching my consulting firm, HumorWorks. I've done over 400 presentations now for nurses and teachers and college students and uh, lawyers. At IBM's Advanced Business Institute, I've done over a, a dozen presentations. My work has appeared in some newspapers like the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune. As we get into my programs, one of the things that we have to fight is the traditional prejudice against humor. Unfortunately, when we were kids in school, a lot of us had teachers who tried to brainwash us into thinking that humor is silly and counterproductive and something we should cut out. Uh, preschoolers laugh on average over 200 times a day, but adults are down to about 15 times a day. So one of the things we try to do is overcome that prejudice and show how humor can be part of a, a creative, productive workforce. A big example here is Herb Kelleher and Southwest Airlines, which is a huge topic because Kelleher has introduced not just humor, but creative thinking and problem solving and camaraderie into the whole organization of Southwest Airlines. The hero of this movement is someone named Herb Kelleher, whom you may have seen on 60 Minutes or read about. Herb Kelleher is the head of Southwest Airlines. Here's a story from Fortune magazine. Is Herb Kelleher America's best CEO? He's wild, he's crazy, he's in a tough business, and he's built the most successful airline in the United States. Here he's flying with a World War I leather helmet on and goggles, and Herb Kelleher explains in the story how sense of humor is the only absolute requirement they have at Southwest Airlines. He said, everything else we can train you for. I flew Southwest two weeks ago, for example, and the pre-flight safety announcement came on, and one of the lines was this, in case of a sudden loss of cabin pressure, oxygen masks will descend automatically. If you're traveling with a small child, put your own mask on first, and then the child's mask, if they've been good. Uh, <laughs> Kelleher, Kelleher shows in his own life and his own leadership a whole new style of management that hasn't been seen in American business for quite some time. The dominant theory of humor that I work with has got a fancy name, but it's a simple idea. It's called the incongruity theory. And it says that humor is enjoying something incongruous. And that means something that's odd, strange, out of place. Something that doesn't fit your ideas of how things should happen. To enjoy something that surprises you or jolts you mentally, you have to step back from it. You have to see it with what I call mental distance. And when you do that, all kinds of situations, especially problems, become easier to solve and easier to treat. Humor is the enjoyment of incongruity. Humor is enjoying something that you're not ready for. Notice, however, that sometimes when we're hit with incongruity, we don't enjoy it. In fact, I'm sure you have this experience at home Something strange happens, you might be laughing, but someone else, like your spouse, for example, isn't laughing. What's the difference between the person who can enjoy incongruity and the person who can't? One of the big factors here I call mental distance. And what I mean by mental distance is, typically the person who can laugh steps back. They're less emotionally involved. They see it from a higher perspective. Let me give a simple example here. When our son Jordan was in third grade, he came down with pneumonia right before the Christmas break. And of course, we took him out of school. 
Jordan's teacher very nicely asked all of his classmates to send him a get well card. In the first couple of cards, he was starting to cheer up. But then he got to this card from Allison McAndrew. It reads, Dear Jordan, I don't want you to know this, but pneumonia can kill you. So get well soon. <clears throat> the next line, Jordan read, Your fried Allison McAndrew. Sorry for the misspelling. She meant to write, of course, your friend, Allison McAndrew. Even the graphics here, which I thought were kind of cheery, Jordan did not see him this way. The tears were streaming down his face. He said, Dad, that flower is dead. And he said, is that in a cemetery or what? By this point, my wife was laughing so hard, she had to leave the room. I was biting the insides of my cheeks to keep from laughing in the little guy's face. Then he went back and he reread that first sentence, which could only be written by somebody about eight years old. He put his head in his hands like this. He said, but dad, if she didn't want me to know, why did she tell me? <laughs> okay. Now, what's the difference between Jordan and his parents? His parents find this very, very funny. Jordan finds this deeply tragic. The difference is mental distance. We can see this in the big picture. Two weeks from now, Jordan, when you're sitting under the Christmas tree opening up your presents, this will be ancient history. He couldn't see it that way. For Jordan, this was here, now, me. In fact, that's a nice recipe for stress. Here, no place else. Now, no, not the past, not the future. Think only about here and now and me, and almost anything can be stressful. The first big benefit of humor is it's healthy. It's healthy both psychologically and also physically. For example, stress, which is a huge problem in the American workplace, costing American employers over $200 billion a year. Stress is physically exactly the opposite of humor. Mentally, humor and stress are the opposite too. For example, they measure stress in your blood with four chemicals. All four go up in stress, but all four go down when you laugh. Your immune system gets suppressed when you're stressed out, but it gets enhanced when you laugh. The medical community now takes humor very seriously. Over a hundred American hospitals now have what are called comedy carts, which are available to patients and also to their families. These include funny videos, uh, cards, um, all kinds of books and magazines. Uh, there's even a, something called the Journal of Nursing Jocularity, which at its peak had a subscriber list of over 35,000 people. And it was estimated that each one of these reached six nurses total. So we're talking about a very wide circulation. Here's uh, from their joke section. Why do nurses actually like PMS? Because once a month they get to act like doctors. Um, anyway, okay. Okay. Um, I've been tracking medicine and humor for years, and I've, I've done lots of presentations at hospitals. Over the years, I've collected these examples from patients' charts. And let me just share a few of these with you. Um, these are things that doctors obviously wrote down fairly hurriedly and then didn't edit. Uh, on the second day, her knee was better. And on the third day, it disappeared completely. Uh, patient has two teenage children, but no other abnormalities. Um, the patient has been depressed ever since she began seeing me in 1996. The patient refused an autopsy. Uh, she, she stated that she had been constipated for most of her life until she got a divorce. The patient has no past history of suicides. The patient, <clears throat> the patient was scheduled to have a bowel resection. However, he took a job as a stockbroker instead. And this, I think, is my favorite. Discharge status, alive but without permission. The second major benefit of humor is what I call mental flexibility, which means the ability to see things from fresh perspectives, to solve problems in creative ways, to manage change, to handle mistakes constructively. Humor is based on understanding a situation from a fresh or a new perspective. And so it automatically makes us more creative and mentally flexible. And as we look at ourselves with this mentally flexible humor, we're going to see ourselves more objectively. The old candid camera used to have a neat motto, see yourself as other people do. And that's exactly what humor allows us to do. Let me give you a, a nice example 
from the world of banking. This one actually combines good morale with mental flexibility. At this bank, the tellers weren't getting along very well. Nobody liked the customers. And each week, the morale at the bank seemed to get a little worse. The manager of the bank announced a contest. She said, we're going to have a worst customer of the week contest. And every Friday, they got together for the last 15 minutes, and they swapped horror stories for that week. Now, you might think, isn't that emphasizing the negative? Well, it is, but the neat thing about humor is it allows you to emphasize the negative without turning cynical or nasty. It allows you to complain without bitching, to put it crudely. Uh, tellers loved the contest. They couldn't wait for Friday. Two things happened right away. By the way, the winner of the contest got a little certificate and a bottle of good champagne, a nice way to start the weekend. The tellers would wait for Friday and they would remember the worst customer they had. The first thing that happened is they started to really listen to each other for a change, to really sympathize with each other. When I hear how you handle that bozo on Tuesday, I feel like I'm on your wavelength, so we're closer as colleagues. The second thing that happened, they wanted to win the champagne, so they wanted to actually get the worst customer of the week. If a teller looked out in the bank and saw some alien life form, right, drooling, Get in my line. How can I help you this morning, sir? The tellers got super nice to the customers. The customers responded by being very nice to the tellers. Six weeks, six bottles of champagne, and the whole problem had been turned around completely. So this is the way in which humor allows us to see things from a fresh perspective, and in doing so, fix all kinds of problems. The third benefit of humor, I call humor as social lubricant, which might sound sleazy, but I certainly don't mean it that way. What I mean is that humor reduces the friction between people, between you and the people you work with and you and your clients. Humor softens conflict. It creates rapport. It allows us to build teams much more easily. Almost any kind of message, especially a negative message like criticism or warning, will be accepted more easily if you use humor. And in my presentations, I talk about how to use humor in your own presentations to make the message get across more easily. Let me close with an example from the world of business that combines all of these different elements. Um, do you know the comic strip Dilbert? Dilbert makes fun of the world of business. And in 1996, Scott Adams, who does the Dilbert strip, came up with a book called The Dilbert Principle, in which he said that in a corporation, incompetent people rise to where they will do the least damage. That is, management, OK? Scott Adams himself is from, he started out his career working for Pacific Bell, so he knows the phone company. Now, AT&T decided to have a conference. They said, he's making fun of us. Instead of just being defensive, they said, let's go along with the humor. So they called a convention. It was called Dispelling the Dilbert Principle. We met in a big hotel in New York. All the organizers, myself included, got this Dilbert tie, which goes like this. Um, Around the room were big and large Dilbert comic strips. Videos were played of some of the Dilbert lessons, et cetera. And what AT&T basically did is they said, let's have fun with this, but let's ask, who's right here? Does Scott Adams have any valid points? And of course he does. So AT&T mixed the camaraderie, they mixed the team spirit, they mixed the sense of fun with good, honest self-criticism. And they did it all with laughter. OK, let me summarize. Well, here's the. Here is the uh, logo for the Dilbert thing. OK, um, let me summarize the whole presentation. Humor is experiencing something that you weren't ready for. But somehow you get a jolt out of this that you like. No animal can do this. You can dress up, for example, in a really funny costume in front of your cat. But your cat will not be amused. Um, <laughs> we are the only creature who can laugh because we're the only creature who can rise above ourselves. We're the only person who can get out of the here, now, me, and see ourselves as other people see us from the outside, OK? You can practice this, and you can put more humor into your life by asking a simple question. The next time you face a crisis, ask yourself, what's this going to look like a year from now? Suppose it's still going to look bad. What's it going to look like five years from now or 10 years from now? You've all got stuff that was a crisis 10 years ago or 15 years ago, and now it's funny. Well, the secret to having a good sense of humor is to reduce the lag time. As we explore the benefits of humor, we also look at negative kinds, such as sarcasm and sexist humor. This naturally takes us into the differences between the way men use humor and the way that women use humor. 
For each presentation, I customize the details to the group and what the group is concerned about. So we will be discussing real examples from real workplaces like yours. By the end of the program, I think you'll see that humor is essential, not just to the workplace, but to your life generally. My programs range from half-hour luncheon talks all the way up to full-day seminars. And naturally, the longer the program, the more time we have for discussion and for interactive exercises.